Uh, my name is Vijay, uh, and we have Satim here. We are from VMware. I'm a product manager, and Satim is a uh, principal engineer at VMware. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is VMware's plan to enable application and VM granular data management. And before I start, just a quick announcement. We have two more sessions uh, scheduled, one for tomorrow at 1 o'clock and one for Thursday at 10.30. So if you have friends who missed the session, you can ask them to come to the uh, tomorrow session or Thursday session. So before I get started, a quick uh, disclaimer, actually an important one. Um, what we're going to talk about here today is investigative, and uh, either from VMware or from our partners, such as Dell, EMC, HP, and IBM, and NetApp, there are no commitments to deliver this in any release, in any GA release. OK. <clears throat> So I'm going to start off the session by uh, talking about what is the problem that we're trying to solve. And we're going to let Satyam tell us how he plans to solve the problem. And then finally, I think we'll have some time for uh, Q&A as well. OK, so before I begin, let me just set the context by uh, reviewing where we are with respect to uh, storage array integration, our efforts around storage array integ integration. So we have two major initiatives in this, uh, in this respect. Uh, one is VAI, or vStorage APIs for array integration, which was introduced in 4.1. And with that, for the very, very first time, we were able to transparently offload um, data operations to the array. And the other uh, initiative that we have, which is being released with vSphere 5, is called VASA, or vStorage APIs for Array Awareness. And the idea with VASA is that you know, we can talk to the array through an autobank channel to discover capabilities, hardware capabilities. And the reason why, and again, to just to set the context, the reason why we embarked on these two uh, projects was to really bridge the gap between you know, the logical view that VMware or vSphere sees and the physical view that the array has. And I think these two initiatives have done its job. And we've come a long way in this, in this effort, in bridging the gap between vSphere and, and storage arrays. But, it's not, but we haven't completed the story here. And the main shortcoming of these two approaches is that it's designed to solve specific problems. So it's not extensible. So as an example, if we wanted to uh, offload any new d data operations that the array has, for us, it's a whole new effort. It's a whole new uh, project. And the implication to the customer is that the, the release of that effort gets delayed. So what we really need is a general framework where any current and future data operations can be leveraged and offloaded to the array. In other words, what we really need is a, is a generalized framework to send VM metadata operations to the array where the array understands what it is and is able to act on it. So this is the first observation that we made with these two projects. The second is, we've talked to a bunch of customers about what VMware can do for them to enable data management and to ease their efforts around data management. And we've had a number of comments from them. A few of them I've, I've uh, shown here. And they all revolve around, hey, you know, there was one comment that we got from, 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 from a number of customers that said, hey, I want to be able to provide differentiated services on a per application basis can VMware help me do that? There's lots of comments around replication and DR, where what customers want is to be able to replicate uh, an application or a VM instead of, uh, instead of replicating the entire LAN and all the applications along with it, and to be able to do failover at the application level. And more importantly, they want to be able to do all this with existing hardware and not be forced to buy additional hardware, such as an active-active cluster solution, to get this going. And finally, we also heard from a lot of customers to, you know, to provide the ability to, uh, to separate out VMDKs into separate buckets and to be able to apply specified, uh, spe uh, specialized services such as dedupe on separate buckets. So net-net, you know, if you filter through all this, what they really want is granular data management. So this is the second observation that we made. So the reason why we cannot provide granular data management today is because the unit of data management on vSphere is very different from the unit of data management on storage systems. 
We operate at the logical level, and they operate at lunch and volume. So essentially, our view consists of you know, applications, uh, which is made up of VMs, which is made up of VMDKs, and arrays operate at lunch and volume level. So to illustrate the problem that I'm uh, talking about, what I have over here is a cluster with a number of VMs and a data store with three VMDKs. So if you really wanted to use hardware replication, you know, the whole uh, data store gets replicated, on, and along with it, all the VMDKs in it. And the same thing, in the same way, if you wanted to snapshot a data store on the hardware, the data store gets snapshot along with all the VMDKs. And instead, what we really want is to be able to replicate a VMDK individually, as well as uh, snapshot a VMDK individually. So to net out what I just said and to summarize, since I'm a product manager, I have a wish list. And my wish list consists of really four basic requirements. Number one, I want to provide the ability for VMware to offload per VMDK data operations to, to, to the hardware. Number two, I want to be able to build a framework which is extensible, in other words, be able to offload not just current data services, but also future data services uh, without major disruption to our infrastructure. And number three, we have 40 million VMs in our install base, and I don't want to disrupt the existing VM creation and VM management workflows as well. And finally, number four, I want all this to be extremely scalable. So I want to be able to scale up to a million VMs, VM, a million VMDKs, or even a billion VMDKs. So those are the fairly four simple requirements that I have. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> so that's what I think to solve. So. <laughs> So the reason why I'm harping on this is because I think it provides immense value to our customer. Number one, it maximizes the ROI or gets them the biggest bang for the buck on their hardware investment. And the reason why it does that is because by providing granular data management, they can now offload or they can utilize and leverage all data services on their array without having to invest in extra hardware or software functionality. And secondly, while the industry is focused more on hardware management issues such as scale-out storage, SSDs, and so on, what customers really care about are applications and how applications are performing. So what this does is, you know, provides, it's a first step uh, to provide, to enabling application-level storage management. And finally, you know, we believe that customers win when vendors innovate. So what we want to do is we want to provide a platform an open platform where, where storage vendors can innovate and provide, uh, provide innovative solutions to our customers. So I want to summarize this and end my piece by, pro, by sharing with you what VMware's vision is and why this initiative is so, is so important. So our vision is to move towards an application-centric view of the world. What that means is I want the user to provision an application and to be able to specify what the application needs, and somehow magically between ESX and the accompanying hardware components, we'll make sure that the requirements are met. In other words, what I really want is I don't want the user to uh, pick and choose a data store in order to meet the application requirements. Instead, just tell us what you want, and we'll do the rest between us and the partners. And a fundamental requirement for this is the unit of data management should be exactly the same between storage arrays and vSphere. And once this happens, we can do some, ama some amazing things with it. So the example that I have over here on the, the screen, I have an ESX cluster with two requirements or profiles or policies, if you will. And when an application is provisioned, we just attach a profile to an application, and voila, the profile gets sent down to the array, the array knows exactly what the profile means. It's now able to uh, provide data services on a per VM basis, so it, it enforces that, the requirement. And same thing for, uh, for all the policies in, uh, in, the, in the cluster. So some of you who may have been following this uh, for a while now may be wondering, why can't this be done using RDMs? Because you can assign an RDM per VMDK and be done with it. You can, except... You know, imagine managing 100 RDMs or 1,000 RDMs or a million, RDMs, a million RDMs. It's just not practical. So, you know, from a simplistic product management uh, mindset, 
I want the functionality of RDMs, but without the, without the management overhead. So that's where I'm going to leave it off with uh, Satyam to, to tell us whether you can meet the challenge. Um, now, I'll just repeat what Vijay said, is the idea here, the challenge here, is to get to the spirit of RDMs yeah. without getting into the storage management problems that RDMs bring in. But before we go about discussing solutions, let's take stock of where we stand currently. And so out here in this picture, I'm showing you a couple of storage systems at the bottom of the slide, and these happen to export uh, some LUNs or NFS mount points which are then connected to vSphere systems, to ESX boxes. And together, these things represent what I uh, tend to call uh, a term as the physical storage fabric. It's a much more static entity. It's configured by the storage administrator and the VM administrator via a whole bunch of email exchanges, and, and sometimes it works. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> on top of the static entity, VMware creates a much more dynamic, much more scalable, manageable, usable virtual storage fabric comprised of data stores, which are nothing but virtual storage systems, and files, which are nothing but virtual disks. And VMs get to use them, and that is what, that virtual disk is what serves the life cycle of the VM, the, the requirements of the VM. In other words, there is this dichotomy uh, that exists in data centers, you know, VMs, and VM users are used to getting their services, their requirements met by the, by the virtual storage fabric. You know, things like uh, VMFS thin provisioning, VMware snapshotting technology, with vSphere 5, even things like replication. And in the bottom, there is this very capable physical storage fabric, which is, which is not quite participating in this life cycle. And so as a consequence of that, you know, that, that disconnect, what happens is, a VM administrator can never express their requirements to the storage system such that it can meet it. And conversely, if there was ever a storage problem that happens with a VM, it is extremely difficult for the storage administrator to figure out how to solve it because they don't know how the VM actually maps to the underlying spindles. Now, the solution out here, at least the direction out here is clear, is if the VMDKs that VMs own and, and, and use, if those VMDKs could be natively stored on storage systems, then storage systems could inherently participate in the VM's lifecycle. And then applications could express their requirements, their data services, their performance requirements uh, out to storage systems through the, that VMDK object, that native VMDK object, and the storage system could potentially meet it. And this new setup, vSphere's role would be that of an arbitrator. It would convey the application's requirement down to the storage system. And then as the VM goes through its life cycle, it would make sure that the storage system actually lives up to all the promises that it made to the applications to start with. And so the path we took is we uh, tried to uh, figure out if this can be done, this, this marriage could be done, through a new set of vStorage APIs. And obviously, it's, just not a, it's not just a matter of making new vStorage APIs. It's a matter of actually changing how storage systems behave to achieve this one-to-one -one mapping between VMDKs and, and underlying storage. Now, when we went to the drawing board, uh, there were a bunch of options. Um, but the overall goal is, and this, this is you know, a pictorial representation of what I showed you in the previous slide, is we want to go from this current model where the VM consumes data services out of vSphere, and we just happen to use the underlying storage system, regardless of how capable it is, as just a dumb medium to do reads and writes. We want to go from this model to this other model where we actually somehow plumb the VM's metadata operations, meta operations, all the way down to the storage system. And not only that, but because the storage system actually somehow magically actually stores these VMDKs as distinct objects, it can actually respond uh, reasonably well to, to these requests. And so, like I was saying, when we went to the drawing board, there were a bunch of options that were available to us. Those were the obvious ones. You know, in the block world, one could imagine that if VMFS were to convey the 
layout of a file to the storage system, then the storage system could use that layout to do things like snapshotting, for example, on a per file basis. But the problem with such a solution is that these layouts tend to change very quickly. You know, if you are, uh, every time VMFS allocates a block or deallocates a block, it'll have to send a new layout to the storage system and it'll have to be kept in sync. Otherwise, the storage system maybe takes a snapshot which contains, uh, which doesn't contain a block that, sh that was just allocated and so on and so forth. The other problem is the layouts are absolutely in control of VMFS. And so it might not be the most efficient representation of a file that the storage system can provide data services on. And lastly, and this was the deal breaker, is if VMFS doesn't understand a data service inherently, then there is no way it can actually convey the layout to the storage system. For example, if VMFS doesn't have the notion of a replica file, which exists on a different data store, then it can never actually convey the layout of that replica file for the storage system to provide replication as a data service on a per file basis. And so that, that went downhill quite quickly. In the NAS world, it is often thought that things are much easier because you know, NAS does files and VM, VMDKs are files. So there's a one-to-one -one mapping, you know, world piece. But it turns out you know, as, as you peel the onion, it's not as, as easy as that because a majority of the NAS devices actually do data services on a per volume basis, per file system basis, not on a per file basis. And so there, there's that inherent mapping problem that we are suffering from. The other thing is, you know, VMs really just want to use block devices. They want to read and write to what looks like this finite sized block device. And so file system semantics are little, you know, a little bit of an overkill. VMs don't really need the, uh, you know, uh, need to create directories or to create symlinks and so on. And it also turns out that 97% of the ESX hardware compatibility list is made out of uh, block devices, SAN devices. And so to declare victory by just mandating that, that every block device vendor go to the SAN, uh, to, to NAS, uh, seems to be a little too impractical. And finally, there's this uh, uh, standard in T10. It's called object storage devices. The idea is the storage system creates an object of the application's choice, and then the storage system provides data services on that object, things like snapshotting and replication and so on. This has been around for maybe a decade or so, but it has been unsuccessful because it requires a forklift upgrade of your existing storage hardware in the data center. Not only that, but it requires a complete redesign of how storage systems are actually implemented. And, and that's not, it, it's not a trivial, trivial redesign. The data paths that you've come to know and trust for a decade will have to be rewritten, and, and people don't like that. The good news is there's a fourth way, and that's what I'm, going, I'm here to talk about, um, which solves this problem. Uh, but instead of first describing that, let me show you uh, show you that fourth way in action. And so out here, I am actually running a prototype ESXi version on the left. Uh, you see the ESXi CLI, the command line. And on the right, you see a prototype uh, storage system from EMC. And so I'm going to uh, issue a command to create a four gigabyte virtual disk on the left. It's, it's hard to read, but I'm going to name the virtual disk Acme Mail Server prod 01, and on the right, you can see that the storage system actually created a four gigabyte object named exactly the, thing, the way I, I, I specified on the command line. And I'm going to do this again. This time around, I'm trying to create a 3.8 gigabyte virtual disk. And again, if you refresh the storage system, scroll down the list, and lo and behold, the last entry in the list is a 3.8 gigabyte VMDK that was just created. Now that's a virtual disk that is natively stored by this storage system. And further, the storage admin can ask for extended properties of these virtual disks, something that was never, ever possible earlier. Uh, we'll go into more details of this, but you know, this is just an introduction. It'll become clearer as we go on. What you just saw, that native representation of a VMDK on the storage system, is called a VM volume. This is a new object, which is the representation of a VMDK on the storage system. Uh, and as the VM goes through its life cycle, as it creates snapshots and replicas and clones and so on, 
you get yet more VM volumes, which are derivatives of the original VM volumes. VM volume, I'm sorry. Now, because the storage system is the one who created the object in the first place, it is obviously inherently tied into the VM lifecycle for the first time ever. And conversely, from an application point of view, for the first time, it can actually express the properties that they are, you know, that it is already used to setting on VMDKs, all the way down for the storage system to actually uh, parse and and execute. And the last thing, and this is something that is more important to me as an engineer, is what I showed you just a slide ago works exactly the same way, regardless of whether you are on a SAN device or a NAS device. And for the first time ever, we are going to put an end to the SAN versus NAS debate as to which one is better for virtualization. Now, many other questions arise. Uh, if, if I show you this one video and leave it at that, is you know, now every VMDK is an object, a distinct object on the storage system, so we are potentially talking about tens of thousands or millions of VM volumes for tens of thousands of VMs that we already manage. And so the question is, how are we going to export these millions of VM volumes all the way up to initiators? Wouldn't it create a storage management problem for storage administrators or for fabric administrators? Wouldn't it require a complete redesign of SAN and NAS systems? Is this even possible in a year or two? And, and to answer that question, let's look at how storage systems are actually architected internally. And these are obviously simplified versions. Um, but on the top right, I'm showing a block storage system. And what it does is there's a whole bunch of physical spindles, rotating media in the back, or SSDs. And there's a volume manager, which takes different parts of different spindles and aggregates them into one volume, which is then exported as a iSCSI LAN or a fiber channel or FCOE LAN. A NAS device is very similar in the back end. There's a volume manager, but then these volumes are formatted as file systems and exported as mount points through NFS. And so the interesting thing here is the back ends are the same. And so we figured, why don't we actually map these volumes one-to-one -one with VMDKs? And it's also the case that it is at the volume manager level that most data services are implemented, things like snapshotting and cloning and replication and so on. And so if we were to map it to VMDKs, then, well, you know, you can further snapshot VMDKs and replicate them and so on. Now, it is the top parts which actually cause most of the storage management problems that you are aware of. And so the next question, obvious question, is to how do you get rid of all the problems, the challenges that will come out of exporting these 10,000 volumes up through, the, through the, uh, the front ends? And to solve that problem, we introduce the concept of an IO deal multiplexer device. Now, this is one single device that exists in the storage system. And it represents a logical channel, logical I.O. channel, from an initiator, an ESX box, to the entire storage system. Not to a LAN, not to one point, to the entire storage system. And so we go from the picture on the left here, where every time you provision a LAN, you got to actually configure access controls for that LAN or, or the mount point. And the VM admin has to configure multipathing and path policies and so on on the initiator side. We go from that one picture to this new picture where you configure just one device per ESX box, and you configure multipathing once for that device, and you have golden. Behind that device can be tens of thousands of virtual volumes that come and go as they please without requiring a change to the physical storage fabric that exists between the storage system and the, and the, and the vSphere cluster. Now, there is one other interesting thing that happens if we transition from this world on the left to the world on the right. You know, in the, in the current state, the LAN also serves another uh, role, which is that of capacity assignment, or a mount point for that matter, is the VM administrator can cow out as many VM decays as, as they want, as long as there is free space on the LAN or mount point. And, on the right, we, we lose that bound. You know, how many VM volumes are you allowed to create before, before it's too much, before the VM user is violating what the storage admin wanted them to stay within? And so to solve the capacity management problem, we introduce yet another concept. It's called a capacity pool, which is a logical assignment of physical real storage space to a VM user, to a context. 
and uh, an assignment of data services that that user is actually allowed to invoke on that physical space. The storage admin creates the capacity profile. And in this example, I'm showing you a, a dummy profile, which is 14 terabytes. And further, the storage admin says that snapshots and replication is allowed on, on that 14 terabytes of space. Now, how that 14 terabytes is cowed up, you know, 10,000 VM, uh, v, uh, VM volumes, 100,000, doesn't matter. You can cow, cow it up as, as much as you want in any which form you want until you run out of that 14 aggregate terabytes. Capacity pools also solve two very important and interesting problems that LUNs and mount points will never, ever be able to solve. The first one is the fact that capacity pools can actually span multiple storage systems, you know, potentially from the same vendor to start with. But you can imagine it can also go across vendors. And this is extremely important because for the first time ever, you can actually manage capacity, let's say, in your primary data center. And the, the replica footprint in your secondary data center under the purview of the same capacity pool. And so, so now capacity management is more in line with how you actually want to manage as opposed to how the storage systems are actually able to do it for you. As so you can manage it per tenant basis, if you are in a public cloud, you know, per company basis. If you're in a private cloud, you can probably manage it on a per BU basis, business unit basis, and so on. The other things, thing they solve is what I refer to as the bin packing problem or the fragmentation of free space problem. Is, for example, let's say you have a 50 terabyte replicated LUN today and another 20 terabyte non-replicated LUN. And further imagine that you have 10 terabytes free on the 50 terabyte LUN and you just ran out of space on the 20 terabyte LUN. Now, if you want to create a non-replicated VM, there is no way for you to create it because you are out of space on the non-replicated LUN, although you are sitting on 10 terabytes of free space, which is not being used at all. And so capacity pools just flatten it out. It's free space is for you to use in any which way you want without compartmentalizing it on a per quality of service profile basis. Well, the last statement might make you think is that, well, so now you can actually allocate space out of these capacity pools, but you lose the way to personalize that space. You know, in the LAN or mount point model, if you create a VMDK on a LAN and that LAN was replicated, then replication is what you get on the VMDK. But, but now, since, since these VM volumes are independent objects, it's, you know, you, you need a way to set the personality of each object. Um, and to solve that problem, we introduced the fourth and final concept, which is called uh, profiles, quality of service profiles. And so these uh, profiles are nothing but a set of uh, uh, QS parameters that you can associate either with a VM volume or with a capacity pool. And so the storage administrator creates a finite number of these. and. Each profile looks like a bunch of uh, attribute value pairs. Some of them are fixed, some of them are customizable. So in this example, I'm showing you a dummy profile called dev profile. I'm showing you some of the snapshot prof properties in the profile. Now clearly, you know, the pro profile might have some other properties too, you know, something related to IOPS, latencies, and so on. But, but you know, I'm just showing you some example properties. And so in this case, the storage administrator has designated that snapshots are allowed for any piece of any VM volume or capacity pool that has this profile. And further, there are some tweakable attributes. You, know, you can tweak the retention policy of snapshots. And by default, the retention policy is one snapshot for the given object. But you can go anywhere from as few as one to as many as 20 snapshots that you can retain. Similarly, there's a snapshot frequency policy that one can define. Now, the VM administrator, on their part, every time they allocate a VM volume, they get to choose a profile that they want to actually impose on that VM volume. Now, if they don't care to tweak that profile, it's just going to get the default properties, but they can also tweak the values in green, at least, to, to customize that particular VM volume exactly the way their application or their VM actually needs it to be. Now, between capacity pools and profiles, you know, we claim, or I claim, 
that we we are now going to let storage administrators to actually designate uh, i'm sorry delegate responsibility without losing control of of what the, the the amount of damage the vm administrator can do on the flip side you know we are actually going to allow vm administrators to use up storage exactly the way their applications want it to without inheriting the liability that comes around with 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 doing management of a storage system now here's a software diagram to show how this all comes together is these new hypothetical storage systems which we promise not to deliver <laughs> <laughs> yet are going to have these new uh, components. One of them is an IOPath component. We call it the IOD multiplexer. And it handles, that's a great way to do data paths in a very, very scalable manner from an extremely large cluster of hosts to a storage system. And the other component is our data management extension. Uh, that's a way for us to convey uh, meta operations, you know, life cycle operations of a VM down to the storage system. And together, this new protocol through which we can communicate to the storage system to create things like uh, VM volumes out of capacity pools is probably hinting towards a new set of vStorage APIs which we'll have to invest in to, to do that communication channel. And goes without saying that just like how we are used to managing uh, virtual disks, just like how we are used to manipulating them through the vSphere SDK, this new kind of object is going to be uh, available through, through the same old VMware SDK as yet another virtual disk type with a bunch of capabilities that you can, you can use either from a UI or from a, a third-party piece of software or some custom software that you write for your own organization. Now I'm going to show you some demos to actually uh, put some meat behind all the concepts we discussed, and then we are going to aggregate all those concepts to doing something interesting. But let me introduce you to the actors in this demo. Uh, we are going to use two fictional organizations. One is Acme, the other one's Initech. And they are going to, <laughs> thanks. They are going to have their own capacity pools out of which they carve out storage as they need. They can carve out storage in one of three profiles, uh, test, dev, and production. And we are going to deploy at least three VMs, one for Acme, and it's going to be a mail server VM, and two varieties of the very famous TPS report server VM for, for Initech. I will start with some concepts, and here's uh, some demonstrations for the three concepts that I left out. Here's IoD multiplexer, again using a prototype system from EMC. We are showing here towards the bottom three IoD multiplexers that are available from this storage system. One of them is an NFS compliant device and two of them are SCSI compliant. One of them is iSCSI, the other one is FC. Now, this happens to be a multi-protocol system and they happen to create an IoD multiplexer for every protocol family that they, that they support. But you can imagine that one can, a storage system can survive just fine just by adhering to one protocol and, uh, and creating one IoD multiplexer. Now, these devices obviously don't have any capacity and so on because they don't hold any data. It is VM volumes that hold data. Switching over to capacity pools, here's a prototype uh, vSphere UI uh, from VMware, where you see regular data stores, but you see two new guys, a uh, capacity pool for Initech on your right, and one for Acme. Now, within the Initech capacity pool, you can see properties that you are used to seeing for data stores, you know, things like overall capacity, use space, free space, and so on. However, unlike data stores, these capacity pools are not bound to any device. They are not backed by any device in the back. And they also have some capabilities. These are profiles. We'll get into that later. And those are shown towards the bottom right. Um, now, this system happens to be connected to a prototype storage system from NetApp. And so we are going to show 
switch to the NetApp UI, which is showing the same two capacity pools. Here's the AnyTech pool. The exact same statistics that you saw on the vSphere UI site. It has a bunch of, it has the notion of a size, the uh, QS profiles one can use off of that capacity pool and so on. As you can also see, the VM volume count is zero. We, we haven't yet provisioned any space from this pool, and we are going to change that as we go on with these demos. Uh, that's a pool for Initech, that's a pool for Acme. Uh, two pools again. Here's a more CLI-oriented view. Uh, this one, a storage system, prototype storage system from Dell, uh, which is showing the same two capacity pools, one for Acme and one for Initech. Now, moving on to QoS profiles, like I said, the storage admin gets to define them. And so again, in this prototype system from EMC, you can see the storage admin towards the bottom has defined three QoS profiles, development, production, and test. And they get to define what it actually means. And so it's, it's slightly hard to see here, but the production profile reads rate protected, uses solid state drives. What that means is every VM volume that you create using the production profile is going to uh, get capacity out of uh, uh, SSD devices in the back. Now we are going to switch over to uh, UI, which is connected to this vSphere client, which is connected to the prototype system from EMC. And the VM admin can look into the VM profiles that are available. It turns out we query the storage system through the data management extension to get the list of profiles. And you see the same three profiles that the storage admin had, had configured on the storage system side with the same description and so on. And so for the first time ever, they, the two guys are on the same page. And uh, maybe a few more months, they can even go out for beer. So those are the concepts. I showed you VM volumes, the very first video I showed you. I showed you capacity pools. I showed you IO demultiplexer devices. And I showed you QoS profiles. Now we are going to make these systems dance, right? And the first thing we'll do is to create a VM volume. Uh, I'm sorry, a VM, which is based off of a VM volume. And this is for the folks at Acme. We are going to deploy a mail server VM using the development profile. So you're going to choose the Acme capacity pool and the development profile here. Now you're going to run through the usual steps in the VM creation process. Notice that in no part, no place here, we actually choose a device. Uh, we, we just choose what we need out of the storage system. We choose a capacity and the, the quality of service for that capacity. The VM creation process is in progress right now. Towards the bottom, you can see the percentage completion. Once it's complete, we are going to switch over to the EMC UI uh, and, and see what happens. Now, we this VM has one VMDK. And we should see two VM volumes that were created on behalf of this VM. And it's two, because one of them is the VM volume for the VMDK, and the other one is what we call a uh, meta VM volume uh, that holds uh, things like the VM log files and the configuration files and the swap file, you know, VM metadata that you are used to seeing. As you can see in this uh, video, the storage admin further decided to introspect the properties of these newly created VM volumes. And they can see exactly the size that was, that was created, the, the virtual machine name that the VM volume belongs to, and so on. Uh, their Acme mail server dev, and there's the VMDK for, for, for that VM volume. There's also many more properties that the administrator can see, and it's going to be clearer later. Here's the outcome of the same operation, creating that one mail server VM on a system from NetApp. As you can see, uh, two VM volumes were created, one for metadata, one for data with the same size as you saw on the EMC system. And this one came out of the development subset of the Acme capacity pool, as you can see on the left. 
Now here's a more CLI-oriented view, again, from the Dell system. You can see the outcome is the same two VM volumes that were created. The storage admin can introspect properties of either of these volumes. We select one of them in this case. And in this case, you can see, they see all the verbose information that they are actually used to seeing out of LUNs today. And they can knock themselves out now seeing the same information out of VM volumes. Now, of course, I kid, but the, the interesting thing here is they can see space utilization stats, uh, IO stats, et cetera, on a per VM volume basis. And so, obviously, this is extremely important information if they were to help VM administrators ever diagnose a storage problem. Not only that, but I'm highlighting in yellow some extra information that they can see the exact VM that is using this VM volume, the, the pool that this capacity came out of, that this VM was provisioned out of, the profile that the VM was provisioned under, and so on. Now, every time you provision a VM, uh, a, a VM volume, uh, there are some consequence, uh, consequences on the capacity pool. You, you use up some capacity. And so if you introspect uh, the properties of the capacity pool, which we are going to do in a few seconds, you can see more advanced stats uh, on the pool, too. There it is. Uh, we are listing properties for the Acme capacity pool. And out here, you can see two V walls that were created, VM volumes, and, and the total amount of use space uh, out of the pool, and so on. Similarly, you can introspect IO demultiplexer devices. This is obviously, again, the storage administrator's point of view. And for the first time ever, they can actually figure out exactly the number of VMs that are doing IO to, to, to that given storage system. Now, the number of VMs that are doing IO might obviously be much, much lesser than the total number of VM volumes that were provisioned, because not all of them might be powered on. Some of the VM volumes might be snapshots and so on. And so the IO demultiplexer information might actually be very interesting uh, for, for uh, IOPS debugging purposes. Now you're going to move on, uh, attempt a slightly more complex op operation. We just deployed a VM. We are going to now not only deploy a VM, but also clone it. And so in this case, we are going to deploy a TPS report server test VM for the folks at Initech. And we are going to do this off of a prototype system from IBM, uh, which does VM volumes. Now, if that deployment goes, goes fine, we are going to clone that test VM to a production profile. And so the same old VM creation steps now. Uh, again, uh, we are going to choose a capacity pool and a QoS profile. This time around, we'll choose any tech. And just like earlier, we are not going to choose a device. It's all, you know, just choose what you actually want, not where you want it. And just like earlier, we are going to see two VM volumes created as a result of this operation, one for metadata, the other one for data. And so we are just about creating the uh, VM the operation is in progress, as you can see at the bottom. And once it finishes, we'll visit the IBM UI. Here it is. Bunch of capacity pools that they have configured. And as you can see, in the Initech pool now, there are two VMs. I'm sorry, two VM volumes uh, belonging to this new VM. Now we are going to clone the VM. So instead of the new VM creation workflow, we are going to choose clone. And here's the clone wizard that they are used to. Like Vijay said, we are not trying to perturb fundamental VM creation and cloning processes that, are, that you are already used to. It just so happens that now it's wired up to this new system of doing things. Now, unlike the LAN and Mount Point world, where you actually would have chosen a new LAN, because that's where production storage comes out of, you choose the same profile. You, you don't have to choose a new LAN. You, you choose the same capacity entitlement, except you ask for a different quality of service. You ask for a production profile. And the VM pre creations, I'm, the, the, I'm sorry, the cloning is going to go on. This one's obviously 100% hardware offloaded because uh, these are entities, VMDK entities, which only the storage system understands. 
as a result, you can see four VM volumes, two new ones, the production ones. They are all coming out of the same capacity pool, as we said. Here's the outcome of the same operation from a NetApp system. As you can see, in the production uh, subtree of the Initech capacity pool, there are two new uh, VM volumes, one for VM metadata and the other one for data. Now, finally, I'm going to show you uh, something that you are not used to doing with VMs. Because a VM administrator is able to now specify the exact quality of service that they expect out of the uh, storage system for a given VM volume, one can potentially, the storage system can potentially do certain data services asynchronously without involving the VM administrator. But the outcomes of these data services are exactly what the VM administrator would have wanted uh, by, by virtue of choosing them upfront. And so here's a storage system which shall not be named. And I'm showing the Acme capacity pool. Uh, three uh, QS profiles, just like earlier, production, dev, and test. Snapshots are allowed on production and development, but not on test profile. As you can see from the allow snapshot property, if you can actually decipher the text. And the snapshotting frequency is different. It's more frequent on the production profile and less frequent on the on the development profile. Similar stuff for the initech capacity pool. There are three, three profiles. Snapshotting is allowed in the production and development profile, the first two, the top two, and not on test. Uh, snapshotting frequency is once every hour on production and once every eight hours on, on development. Now, as time goes on, because by virtue of that profile, it is already specified that thou shall snapshot a given VM volume once every hour or once every eight hours. The storage system can actually just go ahead and do it without, without the VM administrator having to click a button. And as you can imagine, that's the way to go if you are actually managing 50,000 VMs. You, you can't actually afford to visit each one of these every ten, you know, eight hours or every hour to, to click on the snapshotting button. It's, it's, it's good to delegate that responsibility to the storage system. And so we'll, we'll let this storage system go on. You know, we, first of all, we created some VM volumes on this storage system. And out here, I'm showing in the development profile, there are a few new VM volumes that have come around to live. And they are listed towards the bottom of the second set. Uh, and and there, there's a new uh, bunch of VM volumes in the test profile as well. But of course, the test profile doesn't allow snapshotting, so you know it's kind of moot for the purposes of this demo. Now, as I let this you know time pass and the storage system runs, and then we visit the storage system again after a few hours, um, we'll ask the system to evaluate the number of snapshots that it has. I just. I just ran that command, and as you can see, it has come around to having some snapshots. Every snapshot has a new, unique VM volume ID. It also registers the VM volume ID of its parent, the capacity pool that it was actually created in, the time the snapshot was taken, the size of the current snapshot, and so on. For the first time ever, the storage administrator can see VM snapshots just how a VM administrator can. And for the first time ever, the storage system can actually create these snapshots without involving the, the VM administrator. So what I showed you here is a radical new type of storage system. And, and it's engineered such that we can achieve all these new concepts, capacity pool, VMs, uh, capacity pools, VM volumes, IOD multiplexes, et cetera, out of your existing storage systems through maybe a firmware upgrade. And so in terms of logistics, it's a, it's a small step. In terms of what it achieves, I believe it's a really big step. The VM administrators will actually be able to carve out uh, VM volumes, these objects, which map one to one with VMs and associate some quality of service that they actually expect out of these objects. The storage admin, on the other hand, will be able to keep the VM admins within, within bounds via capacity pools. 
and they are able to to assign connectivity to an ever ever growing number of ESX systems in a much much more scalable way than than how it happens today. Together, we believe that these four concepts will lead to a, a new set of radically, you know, better hardware suited for virtual machines that may probably let you do large-scale IT-as-a-service deployment at a much, much lower operational cost. Now, I'd like to end this. You know, that, that was the obvious conclusion, but here's my personal take on it. What you have seen today is probably the biggest collaborative software project that has come out of the high-tech industry in recent history. Six multi-billion companies have got together to actually take your data center hardware to a, probably a fundamental new level. What you've seen today is probably the biggest disruption to SAN and NAS hardware ever since it was first invented. And this is what we are out to do because we believe that we have a responsibility to take your data centers to the next level. My name is Satyam Vagani, and somewhere there is Vijay Ramchandran. I hope uh, this was as interesting to you uh, listening to it as it was for us creating it. Uh, we'll be around for questions, but thanks for attending. <laughs>